So, um, very happy to be here this morning and uh, pray that the Lord will lead us through together to be encouraged. Uh, the goal that my wife and I have come to the States for can be uh, pretty much summarized by Apostle Paul as he uh, wrote to the Romans that he had never seen before physically and was longing to see, to impart to them some spiritual gift. And so he's, he writes to them in Romans chapter 1. Uh, he said, uh, chapter here, verse 11, So for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift that you may be established. That is, that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us by the other's faith, both yours and mine. That sort of summarizes why we're here. And to be honest with you, the, the, the um, African mission work that we're doing is, and in some ways, a Trojan horse to get into churches mm-hmm. that wouldn't let me in otherwise, <laughs> to say what I really need to say. Yeah, yeah, amen. Uh, I don't feel that way here uh-huh. <coughs> because I've been aware of Brother Gibbons' uh, unique uh, ability to communicate God's Word for mm-hmm. many years. As a matter of fact, as a, I had his book, The Kingdom of God, since I went to Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I've, I have it underlined all over the place. <laughs> and so when my, my wife met him, she said, oh, you're the author. <laughs> She's, that's how she knows him, is the author of several books that we've read. And when I went out to Montana, uh, I saw his brochures, or not brochures, the uh, Word of Truth, uh-huh. is it? Yeah. Uh, in print out there, and I'd always grab as many as I could. So uh, I'm not here to uh, straighten you out doctrinally like I have to in many places. <laughs> I'm here to edify uh-huh. and encourage that you may excel still more. Mm-hmm. And uh, if, I have, if I step on your toes, I miss my mark. I was aiming for your heart yeah. at any point. Uh, and if anything here convicts you, let it convict you. Amen? Yeah. Amen. Amen. Uh, don't, we're not here to boast or to brag, no. but in the Lord. That's Amen. right. I don't want to come here and say I'm just a poor sinner, can't do anything. Uh, that's not true. Yeah, that's right. We are, Paul said, I am what I am by the grace of God. Amen. And so God called me from my mother's womb, as Jeremiah said, uh-huh. to do what I'm doing. Mm-hmm. I have no doubt about it. As a long story, but my father was a missionary mm-hmm. and a preacher. And he went off to Africa and took me with him when I was just a little lad. Uh-huh. I grew up in the mission field in Zimbabwe and then in Ghana. And then on returning to America, where my father went to teach at Winston-Salem Bible College and then transferred to Roanoke Bible College, I had no doubt whatsoever that I would go back to share the gospel. I had won several of my friends, Baba, Ate, uh, Hammer. I shared the gospel as a teenager, and I knew that that's what I needed to do. Never doubted it. But uh, I thought I might go by myself. And the Lord had a better plan, yeah. a much better plan. He yeah. said, it's not good for man to dwell on. Amen. So he uh, looked down and had pity upon this poor boy <laughs> and uh, showed me a woman that would go with me to Africa and uh, endure what had to be endured there. And um, that's, that's my wife of 33 years, uh, Sherry um, Hostetter. We've been working and laboring together for 31 years. In, in, in Africa. And uh, you talk about pioneer lady pulling her kids' teeth, helping deliver babies, cooking from scratch, um, water from the well, our first six months, learning language, uh, p- poking worms out of her son's scalp, and carrying him in her arms at night. With, you know, stories I could tell to uh, praise my wife are just very many. I, I, today is uh, Mother's Day. Mm-hmm. I'm glad that this country has such celebrations yes. because, I mean, it's, it's worthy. It's yeah. honorable to yeah, remember amen. mothers. Right. It's something we Christians can participate <laughs> uh-huh. in good conscience with. So I feel sorry for her because her children are either in Cameroon, <laughs> Africa this morning, or they're in New York, mm-hmm. or they're in Bogotanga, Ghana, mm-hmm. or they're in Kumasi, Ghana. We have six children, uh, three that we've adopted and three that she gave birth to. And through the years, of course, they cooked her breakfast in bed and, and coffee and <clears throat> I'm just the only guy here now. <laughs> it's cute as those kids or grandkids. Uh, but uh, we uh, rejoice to be together. A couple scriptures real quickly, and then we're going to look at some pictures. I have a billion things I could say. Uh, I am not usually at loss for words. Um, hardly ever. But I want to give you, in a few minutes, a biblical base for what we're doing in Africa. And... and uh, God loves Africa, and I can prove it from Scripture. 
If you look in places like Psalm 68, verse 31, it says that Africa would quickly stretch out her hands to God. Mm -hmm. And if you go to Isaiah 18, you'll, talk, you'll read about a land of whirring wings where the rivers divide. It talks about a people small, I mean, sorry, tall and smooth. Mm -hmm. Those are talking about Eastern Africans who are tall, like the Maasai, and do not grow much facial hair. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you look there in Isaiah, for example, um, maybe a brother could read that for me. Isaiah um, 18. It's a, it's a prophecy about Africa, about Ethiopia, about Kush. But it says, um, somebody please read verse 2. That sin of ambassadors by the sea, even in vessels of bull rushes upon the waters, saying, Go ye swift messengers to a nation scattered and healed, to a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out, trodden down to land the rivers and spoils. Mm -hmm. Now that's talking about Ethiopia or Kush. And so if you read on, um, read verse 4, please. <laughs> For so the Lord said unto me, I will take my rest, I will consider in my dwelling place like a clear heat upon herbs, and like a cloud of dew in the heat of harvest. Mm -hmm. I go to verse 7. At that time shall the present be brought unto the Lord of hosts of a people scattered and healed, from a people terrible from their beginning hitherto, a nation meted out and trodden underfoot, whose land the rivers have spoiled, the place of the name of the Lord of hosts, the Mount Zion. And the way we know this is about Africa is because of the first verse. So, the the Lord led me um, many ways to, to be in Ethiopia when I was 16. Um, my father, who was in Ghana, flew to Ethiopia with our family, his family, as so we were going back to the States. We landed there and we went to a, a place called Lalibela. Now Lalibela, you look it up on your Google, there's seven church buildings carved out of rock. And if you won't see them unless you fell into them. There's tunnels that that join them. And they were built that way to hide them from Muslim incursion, according to our guide. Of course, they were told angels built them. I don't believe angels literally built them. People chiseled those, devoted to God, devoted to Jesus Christ. Now by then, you know, a lot of doctrinal errors had crept in, like in the Catholic Church, but that, that impetus, that mm -hmm. first burst of devotion and love for God was still there. Mm -hmm. evident in that labor of love and carving out seven church buildings underground out of stone. Mm -hmm. And so how did that perhaps happen? Well, God in his great love for Ethiopia and for Africa gave us a story of an Ethiopian eunuch who was serving a, yeah. a queen called Can Candace or Candace. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's like the pharaoh. That's a title. Candace is not a name, personal name like Candy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's a title of the queens of Ethiopia Many of them led armies to fight successfully against the pharaohs. Mm -hmm. And you can go down there and see stills and cliffs and um, monuments of all kinds. And uh, there are great archaeological troves of treasure there in Ethiopia to this day. And as we were walking there at uh, Lalibala and looking at the church buildings, my father, being a Church of Christ preacher, said, what's that? It was a tank. It looked like a baptistry. And uh, the, he said, is this where they used to dip people for baptism? And, and uh, the guy said, oh, yes, in the ancient days they did that there. Pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, over time, the sprinkling took over. It took yeah. a long time to, to change that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. See, I, I just want you to know that God loves Africa. Mm -hmm. Amen. Mm -hmm. uh, Moses had a Kushite wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, the... The Bible says we regard no man according to flesh in 2 Corinthians mm -hmm. chapter 5, Amen. 16. I grew up in an all-white church in Ohio. Mm -hmm. And still as I travel today, you know, that we have not broken the color barrier in many places. Mm -hmm. It's because of wrong spiritual apprehension of people mm -hmm. and, and what it means to be a child of God. First created yeah. in the image of Adam, yeah. uh -huh. who's the father of us all. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, if we're recreated in the image of Christ, yeah. Where is the room for that? Mm. There isn't any. Yeah. And so I praise God that uh, we are spiritual creatures having a physical existence and we don't have to be subject to prejudice and bias. Amen. And Amen. Now, many black people are prejudiced. Mm -hmm. And Africans have been trained that way. Mm -hmm. Louis Farrakhan and so forth have mm -hmm. disciples in Africa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. An entitlement idea has come in there. I've had immigration officials say, you know, 
I want to build America so I can be on welfare. I'll get more money on that than if I work here. Mm. See, the world is one now. Communication goes at lightning speed. Yeah. Yeah. Anybody can Google anything. Mm -hmm. And there are cafes in small towns in Africa where children can get on them with horrible things. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately. Yeah. We're in a worldwide you know, you know, culture. Mm -hmm. Now, um, it's, it's easy to kill somebody. In three-fourths of a second, a fast draw can shoot someone mm -hmm. in the heart. Three-fourths of a second, someone can kill somebody if you have a handgun in his holster. Mm -hmm. He's fast. It's easy to destroy. But to bring people to life, mm -hmm. to heal and destroy, is a different issue. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> In Africa, there's been war after war. And we're going to show you people who've been subject to war, bullet holes in every hut. Hmm. You can see them on the, the windows and doors because there were tribal, uh, tribal wars that went on between the different tribes like the Gonja and the uh, Kokumba. And when the army came in to solve the problem, they take, took uh, 50 caliber machine guns to the back of trucks and just shot anything that moved. Hmm. One of our young men, Jacob Mile, actually with his family, ran from that gunfire. And as they ran, they, they swam across two rivers to escape the gunfire and stayed in the bush for two weeks with no food or water except what they could get from the muddy river. When they came back, Jacob Miles' father, this is in our century. This is not a thousand years ago. This is in the time when men have walked on the moon in 1968. I saw the moonwalk on TV where we have, you know, all these marvelous technological gadgets. And this young man, when he was maybe 11 or 12, his father said, look, because on the ground was a, the, a, a head of a, a skull of a civet cat. It's like a leopard. It was in a plastic bag hanging by the door, and he worshiped it as his god. And when the soldiers came, they burnt down the hut. The bag had melted, and the skull had fallen to the ground and rolled in front of the doorway. And so the father told Jacob, look at our God, isn't he powerful? How much powerful? Your hut burned down. Mm -hmm. That young man came to, we came to him preaching and to his family. He uh, was able to come to our school and he ended up uh, becoming a Christian. Mm -hmm. And he's now going to Polytech. You talk about a change in every respect. He speaks good English. Uh, is capable in many areas, has an American level a high school degree, getting a college degree, but much more than that, he's become a disciple for Jesus. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah. Like Jesus. Amen. Amen. And a couple of things real quickly is the, to change a culture mm -hmm. takes a generation or two or three. To teach people that work for work's sake, for God's sake, to do everything hard is unto the Lord. Most cultures believe work is a curse. It's a lot of people in America believe that, rather than a privilege, and a way to express ourselves in our glory to God. Mm -hmm. To treat your wife in a respectful way, in a loving way, in an honorable way. To look at women as fellow heirs, and to treat them nicely. I mean, to carry water for her when she's sick. Mm -hmm. It doesn't happen. Then. So we're going to look at pictures now to show the transformation that the gospel of the glory of Christ as 2 Corinthians 4, 4 to 6 talks about mm -hmm. the glory of God in the face of Christ, mm -hmm. the full gospel, we would call it, not just a Jesus who's a bambino in the arms or hanging still on a cross, but a resurrected, ascended, and coronated Lord who reigns now Amen. in his Amen. kingdom Amen. Yeah. in us yeah. and can make us new creations yeah. and Amen. give us the ability to overcome Amen. all things that we couldn't overcome That's before. Right. This message is in Africa, Amen. and it works. Yes. Amen. And the brethren that you would meet there would impress you yeah. with their diligence, mm -hmm. their their love for their families, mm -hmm. their their uh, change of character. Yes. We say in Sri Subhan Adani Kra. Their character is completely changed. Mm -hmm. Amen. We you know no longer, as unfortunately the fact are they having children without marriage. Oh. We get those kids in droves. Mm -hmm. I say to the mother, uh, where's the father? Uh well two point, he's traveled. Oh two point where would he go? Uh somewhere. You're not married, are you? No. Oh, oh, kids without fathers. Mm. Malachi 4, verse 6. What does is, what is Malachi 4, verse 6, the last verse of the Old Testament say? 
mm. talking about John the Baptist or the Elijah that would come. Mm. He would turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons yeah. and the sons to the fathers. Mm. We need that here too, by the yeah, way. That's right. Mm. Mm. Teenagers are an endangered species, so to speak, in the Lord's church. Uh -huh. They're disappearing. There's a Holocaust going on. Satan's taking them through the culture. Yeah. Uh -huh. Through the culture that's wicked and ungodly. Mm -hmm. We have to fight back with the transforming gospel and with every weapon at our disposal. And we're yeah. doing that in Africa, and it's working. Yeah. We can do this, brethren. It's a dark continent, it's been said. A dark continent. You look at a picture of a satellite. You know, at night, from a satellite night of Africa, it is literally a dark place. Look uh -huh. at it compared to India or America. It's just there's not much electricity there. Yeah. Uh -huh. We we have electricity where we live sometimes when yeah. it happens to be on. It's on. It's off. It's very random. But in that place that people call the dark continent, light can shine. Amen. Amen. Isaiah 9, 2, what does it say? Those who live in a dark place will see a great light. Mm. Talking of the Gentiles, yeah. uh -huh. including the Africans. The darker it becomes, the brighter the light shines. Yes. Daniel 12, 3 talks about that shiny. Uh -huh. See, I'm thrilled because in Africa, the poor, the uneducated, the harassed, the downpressed, the downtrodden, mm -hmm. those who are written off by the world. Mm -hmm. Africa is a place of incredible poverty. In Ghana, which is more prosperous than Burkina, where some of the brethren went, mm -hmm. by far, they make $1,600 a year. Mm -hmm. And gasoline costs nearly five dollars a gallon. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine food prices in the cities where they have to truck things in? Mm -hmm. Talk about poverty. Kids in our school that that don't even have a pair of tennis shoes or underwear to wear. Mm -hmm. Again, the words of fathers. Mm -hmm. Well, let's go to the pictures real quick. I'll get the preaching and we'll never show them. Uh, that's just the way it goes. <laughs> So, uh, this is called a lasting legacy, and it's wrong. We told you a lie. It's 31 years in March. So when we made this, it was 30 years. And the longevity of our mission work is due to the empowering of the Holy Spirit, because we have overcome so many things by the grace of God. When we were getting ready to go there, uh, Sherry was a, a young lady in North Carolina. She was in Bible college with me. I was a junior. She was a freshman. Like I said, I thought I'd go by myself, but something about her gentle, quiet spirit attracted me. Mm -hmm. And she, when with, like Lord's Day in the evening, if I went to the Assembly of the Saints, none of the college students went, but she did. I like that. Wednesday, she was there again. Mm -hmm. And we used to, I used to bicycle out to the Assembly, six miles there, six miles back, prepare for Africa. It wouldn't be tough. Mm -hmm. And she was biking too, with a group. Well, the group got smaller and smaller, but she was still there. And we had a prayer meeting on campus. I organized a prayer meeting. There's not enough prayer. We need to have a class in the semester on prayer, I used to say. Well, five or six students came to that little prayer meeting after supper. She was one of them. Mm -hmm. I liked that. Mm -hmm. but, but one day, I, I got the nerve up. I was a hippie. I voted for Jimmy Carter. I was a vegetarian. Uh, don't hold any of that against me. But I also loved God. I wanted to be a missionary. So one day, you know, I... Uh, I got up the nerve to ask this curly-haired, quiet girl, uh, would you like to take a walk with me? And that was our first date, three-mile walk. Mm -hmm. Girls, think about that. No Camaro. You know? yeah. <laughs> and no money. I was poor, and I didn't like spending money. You know, I was, I was a unique person. But we took a walk, and on the way back, I said to her, I said, I said so I heard you're interested. Well, the first time she saw me, I was a vegetarian eating a falfa sprout, so hanging out my mouth. And she and two others came to my dad, who was a professor of missions at the college. And, and I'm there eating real quickly, and I saw this snooty, snooty looking girl, and I kind of like, oh, you know, and kept eating. That's the first time she saw me. I don't know what happened after that, because she told her friend she's going to marry me, which I didn't know. Yeah. And I thought it was my suave ways. <laughs> but as we took that walk, I said, I said, honey, and I didn't say honey then, no boy, but no, no. I said, I said, Sherry. I said, Sherry, I heard you're interested in, in missions. Mm -hmm. uh, what would you do if you went to, like, let's say, Africa, and you know, um, the cockroaches are in the closet skidding around, and you have fever with malaria, and you're shaking, or you can't call home? What would you do? You know, and she's, she's a quiet one, but she's thoughtful, and she said, well, I would think of how Jesus died on the cross for me, and I would just try to keep on keeping on for their soul's sake. Bingo, I've got to marry this girl. <laughs> really, I thought that. I can show you the place on the sidewalk where I thought that. Yeah. As we were walking to Albemarle Sound and came to Knobs Creek Park. And that sidewalk's still there. And that park's still there. 
and the rest is history. We got married. We met in September. We got married in February. Had our first baby, Jessica, and at 13 months, crossed the ocean mm -hmm. to learn the language, to learn, to start to learn how to do something for God in Ghana. Mm -hmm. And my wife has been keeping on keeping on that for 33 years with me. Mm -hmm. So I'd mm -hmm. like you to clap your hands for her and give her mm -hmm. uh, an obey. Just clap your hands. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, when you see a huge task, you have to think, how do, you, how do you handle the task of, we're going to change Ghana, change the world, change Africa? It's too big, too much, it overwhelms you. But we've asked, where, where's a little tyke here? Somebody, can, can you, how do you eat an elephant, young man? Oh. <laughs> you ruined it. You know, we had one boy say, like a cannibal, you hold it in your hands and you eat it. You know. Yeah, you're right, one by the time. But that, I took that picture. We have lots of elephants. They're huge, 10,000 pounds. Yeah. Woohoo! That's pretty big. And how do you eat it? One bite at a time. How do you handle the cause of changing the world? One individual. Yes. We're into discipleship making, uh -huh. not church members. Yeah who yeah. sit in the pew uh -huh. and stink. And, you know, we're in to making disciples who will take on the very character of Christ by impartation through the mm -hmm. Word and personal work. Mm -hmm. Jesus said, go make church members. Yeah. Or did he say, go make disciples? Disciples. Of all the nations. Teaching them to hear everything whatsoever I've commanded you. No, to do or observe whatsoever I've commanded you. We're there not just to throw it out there and web, you know, and leave. We're there to help them observe, to practice what God has told them to do. And you know what? It has to be a show and tell. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what a Christian family looks like. That's right. They have to see it. Mm -hmm. They have no idea what Christian grandparents look like. They have to see them. Mm -hmm. You ask the kids in our school, where's your grandpa? They don't know. Mm -hmm. Where's your dad? Most of them don't know. So we've been there long term for the long term haul to show them and tell them what it looks like to follow Christ mm -hmm. as a family and so forth. So when you see a picture like that, everywhere you go there's plenty of children. Maybe 50% of the population is under the age of 15. Mm -hmm. And this is the war zone I told you about. And this, is, there were, this is where the war took place, Kolkaba country, very remote, uh, crossed two rivers in the past to get there. I was the first white man to get to the village of Wabang. It's long. I can tell you many stories. And then we started preaching after the war. We did some aid with Ives, were able to get in there, and got a hearing. And many people were interested at first, but a few, you know, many are caught, but few are chosen. Yeah, that's right. And so we're praying for wisdom. Who are the ones that God is raising up? Who are the potential Michael Jordans for Jesus? Who can be trained to be leaders? Who can shine as leaders among the people? Because we can't teach them all. Too many. This is one small village, and a village after village after village after village, every two miles on the road. I mean, it's, there's 20 some million Ghanaians, and there's 57 tribes. And that's one country of Africa, which is three times larger than the United States. But if we can get that Spirit of Christ into one, and He can read and understand Scripture. Faith comes by hearing, yeah. and hearing to the Word of Christ. And Paul said in 2 Corinthians 1.13, we write nothing to you except what you can read and what you can understand. So what if they can't read? Yeah. How do you impart faith without the Bible? Hmm. You can tell them many things, but the faith is confirmed by Scripture. And it comes out of the Scripture. So we found this young man, an orphan, Ben a ben Angelo, I call him Ben, and he was at every one of the preaching meetings, sitting in front. I thought he was a girl at first. He wasn't. He was a young man, and he had a special spirit about him. He, he just helped set up benches. He was there. He didn't ask me for anything. He never hinted that he wanted anything from me financially or whatever. He was just loving everything, loving the word, loving the singing, loving being there. And so we invited him to come to the city with us. Never saw an asphalt road, never saw electricity, never saw running water, never saw a flush toilet. What a big adventure as we took him to this capital and he lived among us in Kamasi and then he was trained in our Christian school which is like Bible college, VBS, camp and a private apprenticeship program combined. Mm -hmm. And through that combination we can then impart to him the skills needed to be a leader. Mm. But he had to bring the spirit to it. He had to bring his attitude yeah, to it. He yeah, had to be right. ready for it. It had to be something God indicated. 
And, and uh, people ask, how do you get your students? I don't know. God does. Amen. It's, Amen. Not, it's not a science. Yeah. It's an art. You just pray for wisdom. And we have students from all over the place, from different backgrounds, like Ben and Angelo, and now they're leaders. Mm -hmm. They're starting schools. They're, they're doing what we're doing. We're pra we've passed the baton of faith on. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And now we've done 40 some more weddings and they're having kids. We're grandma and grandpa to dozens and dozens of kids and we're imparting to them our, our life, the yeah. life we have in Christ, the knowledge we have in Scripture. Our zeal, our enthusiasm magnified to the third generation mm -hmm. from glory to glory. Yeah. Does that excite you? It excites me. Uh -huh. I can't wait to get back. <laughs> Two more weeks. For example, Jackson. If someone came to me and said, there's a boy whose mother died. His father's a Church of Christ preacher. Sorry, his father died. And he's a Church of Christ preacher. And they were divorced and he's on his own. Could you take him to your school? We didn't take him to our school. We took him into our house. My son was in college on a scholarship in Marist College, New York. We had a room there. We'd had another child that we had for four years. His brother took him away. Empty nest. I said, honey, you need another boy. You love boys. She said, she prayed about it. Took in Jackson. You know what happened? We took in Jackson. His older brother, Atta, married my daughter. <laughs> and they're serving the Lord now and have four wonderful grandchildren. Yeah. You lose a daughter, get four grandchildren. Almost balances out. <laughs> <laughs> but awesome. Because we heeded the Lord. Mm. And my wife honestly did much more of the work in raising him than me. Mm. I just made the decision and she did so much of the work. Mm. Like washing his clothes, mm. feeding him three times a day, you know teaching him to do a budget, uh, helping him with his homework. I mean, I, I played basketball with him. I took him to do many things, taught him scripture, but thank God. Now, when we look at this picture, it's to illustrate the horrible condition of children and people in Africa. Why? Because of sin. Yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. They never say that in the newspapers and magazines. It's sin. Yeah, amen. Where are the dads for these kids? They're not there. Yeah. Amatima here died of cancer at eight. And we, I took her in my arms and we went into the taxi and I'm crying the whole way there with Brittany, my daughter-in-law, and we walk, literally walk into the can the one place where there's a cancer specialist. He shows me dozens and dozens of pictures and says, I'm the only oncologist or cancer specialist for 10 million people, or the whole northern part of the country from where we are to the north. But you know, I, she's, she's with the Lord. Mm -hmm. Yes. Jesus said, let the little children come unto me. That's right. But what about the sin that we can't show you? Yeah. Children, there's not a single children's park in our whole city of over a million mm -hmm. that I know of. No playground. Kids play in the street, and we've seen them struck down by cars many times. The children are abandoned because of the sexual immorality and the God of that immoral mm -hmm. bail, the hip-hop culture that has come from America to there, mm -hmm. the Hollywood perversion there, yeah. mm -hmm. plus the Islamic lie, five wives. How many wives did Muhammad have? How, why, how young was his last wife? They have all these horrible influences. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our decadent American plus Islam and plus denominational weakness, and they're confused. Jesus said in Matthew 9, they're like sheep without a shepherd, verse 33 and 36. Scattered on the hills. And the heart breaks to see that. But what we can do is we can give them eternal life and streets of gold to walk on one day and teach them how to love as Christ loved their own children and teach them that God can be with them. So it's heart-rending work there. It is heart-rending to see that every day and to live among that every day, but worse seeing the sin and the, and, and the whole uh -huh. broken up culture. Of course, there's sin here in this problems here, yeah. all over the world. <coughs> Here's a girl who was dying. She was laying in a corn bin, Tabitha. We happened to be visiting there, and I walked the village, and I walked by with the, the evangelist there. He was the un uncle of this girl, and I saw this girl lying there without clothing in great pain, and I said, who's this girl? Oh, she's so-and-so. What's wrong? She has tuberculosis. Well, can't she be helped? It took thousands of dollars, but she now is saved from that sickness. Intervention is not always cheap and easy. It takes time, energy, money, and lots of prayer and faith. 
lying, can you imagine young ladies lying without clothing where they store corn with the cockroaches and bugs and heat just dying day by day by day slowly with no one caring. This girl here now did care for her. Daniel the preacher brought her. She could not walk. We gave her vitamin C and prayed. She began walking and getting a little better. And then we were able to bring her to the hospital in Kamasi. And uh, she recovered. I don't know what she had on. Did we ever find out what she had? No. I don't think we did. So we become uh, caregivers to many. Showing them Christ's love. This, you ever heard of the guinea worm, three feet long? comes out of the body. It grows from the, what you drink in. It's a parasite, and it grows three feet long, and it comes out any part of the body. It looks like a satanic scourge. If you've ever been to a village where people can't walk for months because it's coming out of their feet, and you can't walk, and if you break off the worm before it's all the way out, it'll uh, multiply. You have to roll it on a stick for weeks until it's completely out of the body. I believe they've eradicated this in the last year or two in Ghana. I hope that's true. Again, we're just overwhelmed by the need, so we have to put our faith that God has allowed this to bring people to repentance, uh -huh. that God is going to use this, that we can glorify Him by the good deeds we can do in the middle of this. And people do see. You know, every African usually would like more money. Well, what American? Better house, you know, whatever. I ignore them all. Go get a job, I tell them. But yeah, Juma. I said, go, oh, yeah, Jim. I said, oh, well, hold on. I said, you have strength. Go get a job. Mm -hmm. But the ones with no legs. We have a girl in our house, Janet, right now, has one leg. How does a girl in the village go on one leg to carry a bucket of water 80 pounds? Mm -hmm. I mean, a big basin and go up the hill with it. How does she pound food? How does she farm? So we find people in desperate need that even they understand are unusually uh -huh. cursed or burdened. And then we help that one as an example of Christ's love. And it's like, you want us to help you too? Cut off two legs. <laughs> yeah. okay. Have lightning hit your house or something. Yeah. And so that's been a goal, is to find targeted places to do good deeds, to show that we care about them, and open their hearts and their ears to the message, preach the message, and then out of that, the few who are truly caught, we then equip them to observe all things, to thoroughly make them disciples for Jesus and become like Jesus. And it's not what we can do that counts, it's what we can help them learn to do for themselves, and sharing the gospel, providing for their own needs, standing on their two feet. We're not going to enable them. I don't believe in that entitlement mess. Mm -hmm. We're going to empower them through giving them the tools of spiritual strength and other things that can help them <laughs> to change that crazy cycle yeah. for once and for all. Well, um, the key has been our family. We called it our teamly. And we never had terrible teens. Give a terrible twos. We had terrific teens. Yeah. <laughs> terrific teens. We can either think of our children as ordinary or extraordinary. They can be daring Daniels for Jesus or can just be whatever. Shadri, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Joseph. How many stories of young people do we need to yeah. see that God yeah. loves young people yeah. and he can power them up and make them extraordinary people? And our children learned from a very early age that you are here on earth to serve God, not be served. Yeah. Amen. You're here on earth to glorify God with all their talents. If you have parents, one day my son had a kind of a feel sorry for himself, bad mood. I went in and said, son, you've got to stop this. You have mom and dad that love you. You have good food. You have your own bed. You have education. You have the Bible. You know the Lord. And he's like, you're right. <laughs> It's not about me, it's about Him. Amen. Amen. Teach our kids Amen. that purpose and they won't leave the church. Yeah. They won't leave the Lord. Right. Get them busy, busy, busy serving God and make it a joyful thing. I like the old movie, Whistle While You Work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I mean, hey family, we love serving God together. We love seeking and saving the lost. We love going to the boats. My kids would go and do Duck Duck Goose and Red Rover with all... They'd have three or four hundred village kids. Well, I taught the men. My wife was teaching the ladies. We're teaching, 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 teaching. So this is the early years. We were just, we didn't know what we were doing, but we're learning to speak tree. So tree, sweet tree, cuss, and yes, and get to a crowd. What do I see? I said, if you want to learn that language, it's really hard. It's tonal. So we would say funny things like if you have barn fulls of hemorrhoids, but you don't get to heaven, you've gained nothing. Because <laughs> because the word coco can be coco, coco, coco. 
It's a tone, tune. And if you say it wrong, instead of being cocoa the cash crop, it's cocoa the hemorrhoids. <laughs> and these farmers look at me like, yeah, we, we'll agree with that one. <laughs> we don't get enough refuge around here. <laughs> Excuse me, I don't want to be crude. But uh, you got to learn to laugh at yourself yeah. and, and humble yourself. Yeah. I have a degree from Bible college. I was an SAT 99% and, um, and um, I'm a smart guy. And, and then it's like, wah, wah. Me want Wawa, my name Jeffy. You know? <laughs> Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. They think you're an idiot. You have no credibility until you gain it. It's really good for you. It's really good for you. God loves to humble us. So uh, we had storms like you have here, broken jaw. That was a bicycle accident. Should have killed me. A girl ran in front of me, hit the ground on my bike. We're trying to get some water for our, our house because we had no water and I had to go get some from the city water people in, in the city there. Broke my jaw and the people said, look, the witches have done that to brother. Well, they didn't call me brother, to Jeff. Uh -huh. I came back and said, shred me, aboji, don't be no. I said, look at my jaw bone. I said, God has so much more power than Satan. Yes. What a testimony Amen. God gave us. That's a long story. I've told some of that story, but God delivered us. Uh-huh. He delivered us many times from many things. I could give you stories, and we stand here till tomorrow. But stories of God delivering our family from temptations, from evil, gun to the head of a Nigerian armed robber in my house like this. I got his bite marks on my leg. Been delivered from malaria, typhoid, hepatitis, salmonella poisoning. You name it. We've been guinea pigs for tropical diseases. And never read a tropical disease handbook before you go to Africa. Just throw that thing away. Because yeah. you'll have everything in there. <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing what you'll find in those things. They're just yeah. like, what is this? You know, Zamboya, Balula, and then it's like, forget it. So God has delivered us. And during this time, we learned to work together. Uh -huh. We learned we needed the Holy Spirit. Yeah. I went on a quest for power. Mm. Power to overcome myself. Satan, the world, and be able to be as enthusiastic as I needed to be to, to, for our family to make it. And brethren, I, I didn't make it before I learned that. And I found in my life sin, I was grievous to me. I was so uncomfortable with what I had become. I wanted to do the right thing, but like we see in Romans 7, I didn't have the power in my flesh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. By the grace of God, I went to Grundy and I, met, I went to see Don DeWell, but he had died. But I heard some great preaching, met some great men, and I ended up being saved by Christ. Mm -hmm. Amen. I got baptized with the understanding I needed. I received the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. And our family went from glory to glory since then. Not that it's been easy or we've always been perfect, but there's been victory. Mm -hmm. and there's been lessons learned and more victory. And, and uh, God can do this in our lives. But in these early years, I glorify Him because although I wasn't ready yet for what I needed, I was being made ready. Mm -hmm. Amen. By, you sometimes learn by falling. Uh -huh. You learn your weakness. And then you learn to, re to want the power of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. uh, the saint, the devil would want the Holy Spirit if it made you feel good, like smoking something mm. or eating mushrooms. The Holy Spirit's not a feel-good fix-it to make That's us feel right. happy, happy. Amen. The Holy Spirit's to give us the strength to be able to be like Christ. Amen. And what did Christ do? He came to seek and save the lost. He left heaven to be a missionary. If we're not having His purpose, which is to seek and save the lost, to glorify Him in our life so that people be drawn unto Him, we don't need the Holy Spirit. Uh -huh. Now, granted, He does fix us. Uh -huh. He restores and redeems, and, but He's in us for a purpose to be yeah. like Jesus all over again yeah. in another body. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think you all believe this. Yes, amen. amen. And I'm just saying, we learn this, and, and I had to learn it, mm -hmm. but our family learned it together. Yeah. Amen. And that's precious. Mm -hmm. I saw preachers, and I don't, but you know, many preachers lost their whole family to Satan. Mm -hmm. And I thought, God, I don't want to win all Africa to the Lord and lose my family to Satan. Mm. Yeah. I bled with the Lord. Please, Lord, help me as we save others to save ourselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that's why we were delivered.
So these are pictures of flannel graphs. Some of you remember that on the side of the car. Bible Club. Our kids did Children's Library. They did Saturday BBSs. They helped all the time in the ministry. Mm -hmm. We were together. So this is my wife. She started daycare of 300 kids. We had a big picture. It's all West Africa and all Africa and all the world. It's always got to be your picture. All of us have to think that way. Wherever God leads us, whatever we can increase our sphere, Lord, increase our reign. Give us ten cities. Give us five cities, two cities, but don't let us bury our town in the hole. Mm -hmm. And so I've always prayed that Lord would expand our ministry as he saw fit. So we went to Togo, the country next to us, and one of the worst countries in the world for voodoo. This lady was a sorceress, married, and she got baptized into Christ. There was a riot. She burnt her omelets, and the chief had to stop his own people from killing her. Oh. And the preacher's there. And see... Our, we took teams like Benjit from India and Melissa from Chicago, who was a dog walker for a millionaire. That's how we found her. That's a long story. Uh, Brent from Missouri, up at Fulton. Mm -hmm. uh, and his sister, Alyssa from Missouri. By the way, I got to baptize them both into Christ. Mm -hmm. And her too. <laughs> and he did later. So they come, and they don't know what's going on. They just come to do a good work in Africa. They think mm -hmm. they're good people. And then they get the Bible preached to them for the first time in all its truth. And then they examine themselves. And often, if they see they're already saved, mm -hmm. they're already in Christ, then they, they, they understand they have power. But if they, they aren't in Christ, they get into Christ. Mm -hmm. And so we get to save many who come to us to do good deeds, if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's, it's fair. They're coming to do a good thing, and God gives them the best thing. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. It, just, it makes sense to me. That's right. You know, they left America. They left their family for a year. Many of them come for a year to work in our school, to work to teach English, to help. And then during that time, they get what God wanted them to get. Mm -hmm. We're a very intense spiritual environment at our house, in our ministry. Mm -hmm. And I preach Monday, uh, every day, mm -hmm. except maybe Friday evening. We have family night, and then we just have some fun with the family and, and all. But we pray then too, teaching the Word of God all the time. Mm -hmm. So our daughter, Rebecca, our second daughter, she... She uh, decided to be a missionary here. These guys are weightlifters. They started a weightlifting ministry um, in the early years. So we could teach them strength. And we say, this isn't real strength. Real strength is overcome temptation. Mm -hmm. We'd go into high schools and we'd lift huge weights up and we'd say, God can lift up your sin barrier and take yeah, it from you. Amen. We used it as an avenue to win souls. We still have the gym strength ministry. Some of our lifters have gone on TV to be strongman contestants. It's really fun. But to glorify God, yeah. who gives us real strength? Mm -hmm. Physical strength is nothing. It means nothing. Flesh profits nothing. But it's a tool so you to teach them to think about what really counts yeah. and to reach them where they're at, uh -huh. uh, at their level. So we have that. Well, um, Rebecca's going to go to Togo, but then this young man came from Long Island. He was an Indian citizen, but he lived in New York all his life, had his own business. Most evangelistic guy I've ever met. Met him at a preaching camp in New York. Long story short, he came over there when his church, there were um, non-instrumental people, kicked him out because of his association with us. Mm -hmm. and he called and said, Mr. H, I don't know what they kicked me out. I said, well, you have three choices. You can start a new church up there. Not easy thing for a young man to do. Doesn't have much experience. You could try. Or you could join a church that you believe teaches the truth. So he, he went to one place. They said you have to be baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit or you're not a Christian. He, you know, a lot of legalism and he went here and there. So... I said, you have a third choice. You go back to India, be a missionary to your own people. Mm. He liked that one. Mm. And he took my daughter with him. <laughs> <laughs> Ten years ago. Yeah. But first he apprenticed with us, and here he is after a year and a half of working with us in Ghana, being apprenticed as a preacher, okay. being prayed for. That was now ten years ago. Mm. They've been married twelve years. And they went to India. When they took our baby Anastasia, I knew what my father-in-law felt. Yeah. I cried the whole day. <laughs> Our first granddaughter. Mm. They're taking her to India. My wife said, oh, I said, okay, I'm glad that they're going for God. And I was okay. Uh -huh. Really. Since then, I've been okay. Yeah. So thankful. And so, these are some more pictures of Rebecca growing up. She's a sweetheart. Maybe you can meet her someday. She loves the Lord. We had armed robbers break in. And when they were in there, she was, we were all laying on the ground. And she looked at him and said, what did I do, Dad? I said, you know, I don't forget prayers. So she started quoting her memory work. She, quote, she memorized tons of Bible memory work. That really helped her. There she is in the weightlifting program. But see, the thing is, what good is it me to go over and tell the Africans, memorize scripture, uh, be holy and righteous, uh, 
hit all the assemblies and be on time because you love the Lord, not because it's a law, and etc. If we didn't show them, mm-hmm. yeah. you got to show people. Yeah, they got to see it in the leader. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11, 1, imitate me as I imitate Christ. It's leadership by example that counts. It's not just telling them. And so praise God that our family and our daughters picked up that faith as I talked about. That was a wedding back when, when she, she knows I'm going to run out of time. But um, there it is. There it is. But Benoit did wedding business in New York for Indian weddings. I mean, he had 300 people, so he brought nine suitcases of stuff, and it was a big wedding because by then, everyone, you know, I've done a lot of ministry, my wife and I, and they knew Mr. H, or Brother Jeff, and so they came in their great numbers, and it was all about Christ. I preached 45, 50 minutes. Mm-hmm. I preached at this one about the Shulamite bride and Solomon. <laughs> and um, great testimony. So these are pictures of uh, India, and we go there now. We've been to India. Still in Ghana. Okay. And then go on to India. There we go. There's India. So we go there now. We've been there every year to encourage. And he has three house churches that he's uh, leading. Great men like Titus, Sabu. It's just marvelous to see the work there. Uh, he's my biggest confidant and advisor. He's my son-in-law. Before we came here, we stayed up to 4.30, though we're traveling for 15 hours the next day. And the advice and things we shared have really spurred me on. Put the Lord first, to seek His face, to trust in Him in all things, and to encourage the saints with the truth. That's, that's, he's a very holy man. That's our four grandkids over in India. So, Then our oldest daughter, uh, she went to America when, after graduating 16. They all graduated from our Christian school. And she is now full-time ministering. At, she's 32, and she's in Ghana with her husband, Atta. Mm-hmm. And they're doing a great work for the Lord there in music, in youth, in daycare, preschool. Mm-hmm. Sorry, a little technical glitch here. Mm-hmm. This is the first time we've done this kind of program this way. So it's, mm-hmm. we're learning it. When she was 16, she went to state. She had a house. She lived in Montana. She had a car, job, da-da-da-da. She... She caught up, so I want to come back to Ghana. I said, you ready to work? Oh, yeah. We gave her 17 kids who could not speak English or read or write as her kids because we started the school that year. Huh? If you've ever tried to teach someone, a child, 17? What a challenge. She, she, many of those are now married in the Lord. Some are helping minister. Uh, it's great joy to see that. Brother Atta remembers father died and his brother was Jackson. So they're the incredible family. <laughs> That's dress up day. And uh, just you can see what they're doing. They're working with the young people. And by the way, I don't think brothers and sisters should ever have sibling robbery yeah. out. They should love each other. And I tell, I say to the kids, the way you treat your brothers, the way you treat your husband. The way you treat your sisters, the way you treat your wife. You want a happy marriage? You better treat your brother nicely. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we taught him. Mm-hmm. And so when Jeremiah got married, our son, he and his sister Jessica had a double wedding on the same day. Mm-hmm. What a great testimony. Mm-hmm. They were the best of friends. Yeah. That's how it should be. So, um, you know, you know that. So, Brittany is our weirdest uh, member of our family. <laughs> when she, she was from Oklahoma City. Her dad is a criminal. He was in prison 16 years. She never really met him. He died taking meth and riding his motorcycle in the back of a truck the day he was let out, a few days after out of being let out of prison. So she's from Missouri because at 14, her uh, friend, Reese Thomas, of her grandpa, knew about her and was able to organize a, a rescue operation where she was <laughs> given sleeping pills and driven out of Oklahoma City to Fulton, Missouri and woke up in the morning. <laughs> That's where she was. Mm-hmm. Now, she didn't repent then. And she got into a lot of bad things in her life, wicked things. Mm-hmm. And so Brother Reese, up there at Fulton, he's a chemist. He has his own laboratory. He also does some teaching up there in the, in the church. It's the Church of Christ up there. He heard about us for years. He said, could you take this girl, this redhead girl, 
and take her to your home in Africa. We prayed about it and said, okay. It's going to be a challenge. It's going to be a big challenge. So she came, didn't even know when she came to Africa we were missionaries. It was a black op operation. <laughs> she came off the plane with a boyfriend already, addicted to several things. My daughter stayed up with her for several nights so she could detox. We kept her busy in our weight gym ministry, you know, in, in the school, going out to the villages. Lots of Bible, 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 prayer, 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 encouragement. She ran away to the city, one white girl among millions. Thought she'd die. She came back. She survived. She smoked some stuff and then she done things. She was sorry, though. My wife was perfect. She said, don't worry about it, honey. We love you. We just want you to be safe. She didn't get in a tantrum. Later on, her brother, Gary, she called him. She called, this is an amazing story. She called him on the telephone and shared scripture that I gave her. She didn't know the Bible. I say Romans. She'd say Romulans from Star Trek. I say Phil Philippians. She'd say Filipinos. But she'd feed him those scriptures. Gary, through the phone call conversation from his sister, asked a black street preacher in Oklahoma City to baptize him. Was giving Bibles, but he was a member of a gang, hardcore gang skinhead type of gamers. He was killed, shot in the head and the heart after he was baptized. And my opinion is there was no church there to sustain him, no way for him to be sustained, and the Lord just took him home quickly. Uh -huh. yeah. That's my opinion. Yeah. And I recently, a, a friend of her father's told Brittany that before he died, he had quit his drugs. He really had repented. Very encouraging. Amen. She has a tender heart, and she, she, we were able to baptize him to Christ. My son comes from New York, from his college, or Maris College, and he's smitten by her. After courtship, they marry. And now, Brittany, from the long side of the truck, married to the preacher's kid, the goody goody preacher kid. They're, you know, they worked with us six years, and now they're in Cameroon. And uh, my son got a political science degree, first of his class out of 5,000 students in the university. He wanted to show what God could do, A, and B, what our little Christian school could do, because a lot of people made fun of it. Mm -hmm. He showed them. Yeah. with the help of the Lord. Amen. So the vice chancellor gave him the, the what do you call it, the diploma mm -hmm. on TV. My wife is the same. She homeschooled and it's like, that's my boy. <laughs> <laughs> my boy, that's my boy. <laughs> All you who made fun of homeschooling and Christians, right. hey, so he's got a political science degree, but he doesn't use it. He's doing the Lord's work full time. Uh -huh. Dangerous country, 200, they call it the armpit of Africa, full of corruption. They drink, it, there, it's so many bad things over there. They're going through what we went when we were young people. And we're with them. Just today we heard that he was so sick he couldn't get out of bed. So my wife's calling him up this morning. Are you okay? How are you, are you buddy? He's okay. I think it's stress. Sometimes it gets to them. They could have died in this car accident. It flipped over. Jonathan was eating a sandwich. After the accident, he brushed his sandwich off and went to eat it. That's the boy knows priorities. <laughs> <laughs> Hannah slept through the whole thing. Not a scratch on them. Mm. Wow. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. Why do we pray? You know why we pray. That's right. Look at that vehicle. Not a scratch on them. The car was told. They got a better car now. So we go there. We've been there twice. And we're now in the mentoring role at our stage in life to, 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 to encourage but help them be their own people. Help them follow the Lord. We don't want them to be under our thumb, but want to come under them and beside them and, and say, look, son, this is what we did that worked. Mm -hmm. These are scriptures that you look at. And we have very deep conversations. That young man knows the Bible. It's like listening to a tape recorder sometimes. Like, oh, yeah, I hope he says this. Oh, he did. Cover that point, son. Oh, he did. So <laughs> if I die today, there's a legacy there. Praise God. Yeah. Yeah. Africa still has a champion. Look at the roads, they're legendary. You can Google Cameroonian roads, you'll see amazing things. Yeah. People stuck for two weeks. And the food, uh, but it's an abundant life. It's an adventure for Christ. He said, come follow me. He said, I will give you an abundant life. He doesn't want to, they're not, it's a wonderful life to serve the Lord. We're, we're getting ready to climb up Mount Cameroon. He lives on a volcanic mountain, 14,000 feet high. Second biggest mountain in, the, in Africa. You gotta look at it like an adventure for the Lord. Yeah. Yes, there's hard times, there's tough times, there's heartbreaking times, but there's consolation from the Comforter. Yeah. And there's a brethren, and there's the angels that also minister to us. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Amen. And so, what better than to leave all, 
Give all, do all, anything, anywhere, Lord, I'm yours, I'm mine. This is what we taught our family. So we taught, taught. You know, Isaiah said, Here am I, Lord, send thou me. That's the attitude we imparted. We had another girl God gave us. She was dying of TB, lying in, a, in, in the zongo, they call it, the ghetto. We were doing some benevolent work back in 1990 after a big storm. And she was in great pain. And I said to the mother, Ah, Daniel, to know I said, Why is she laying there? The mother said she needs a doctor, needs a hospital, no money. They're so poor, they had a gourd that they, they cost two cents. And the grandma had sewn the crack in the gourd to reuse it, mm -hmm. to hold things. That's how poor they were. They're from the far north, the Wangara tribe from Burkina. And as far as I know, they're the first Burkinans of that tribe, at least in Ghana, to become a Christian. We, it's a long story, but she ended up in the States in Raleigh Hospital, New Jersey. Half a million dollars worth of treatment. The doctor moved his heart with his hand and cut the TB out. She should have died. She didn't die. Isn't our God great? Amen. She survived it. But after three years, Homeland Security deported her. She was a threat, I guess, with her braces all over her body yeah. and her canes. But she came back to us, and, and I couldn't send her to the Zongu, to the Muslim people. No, she, how would she even use a toilet? So we took her in as our child. And every day we stretched her and we worked with her. She was stubborn. She fit right in. And <laughs> but at 19, Abby asked me to baptize her into Christ. And uh, afterwards, you know, she, she said, Dad, can I talk to you? I said, sure. We sat down. She said, sorry for all the trouble I caused you. I said, what? If she was the only one to be saved by being in Ghana 31 years, it's worth it. She now uh, has a beautiful family, two children. Shouldn't be able to have children if you looked at her medical records. She's supposed to be about, oh, probably five foot nine, ten tall. Her whole spinal cord is completely twisted. The TB just ate it away. She, and they're doing the same work we're doing. They have a Christian school, home church, up in Bogotonga. Her husband's from that area. He came to our school from a different tribe. We have lots of kids from different tribes marrying each other, and, of course, different cultures. Any man being Christ is a new creature. We no longer regard any man according to the flesh. We're showing it, not just Amen. telling it. What matters is the faith of the individual. Amen. Amen. Not what they look like or where they're from in the background. And God's done all that. All that. I didn't bring Brittany to us. I didn't bring Abby to us. I just found her and God opened my eyes to do something. I didn't have the money to help her. God provided that. We just kind of get out of the way and then follow the Lord and it all happens. The brother here, we have many African preachers we've worked with. And you know, I'm really conscious that we don't want to make them dependent on us financially or spiritually. On the Lord! Yeah. I preached this. I said, it's, the Bible doesn't say, our Father, our government who's in Washington, D.C., give us this day our daily bread. But our Father in heaven, give us our daily Amen. bread. Amen. They have to learn to have faith. I lift weights. It doesn't help me to lift the big weights and they, don't, they watch me. They've got to lift. Yeah. They've got to lift by faith. And so, Brother Omani lives in the village. We have work. This is where Abby's from up here in the Bogotonga area. We have a work over... I can't see this angle. We have work over here we'll show you. And we were in Bongohafa for nine years in this area. Now we're in the Santi region in Kamasi, the second largest city. And we've got people in Accra. And we've got people like you saw in Togo. We're trying to be strategic like Paul. Ephesus, Corinth, right. regional capitals. That's right. And get schools in those regional capitals and quality strong churches like the Antioch Church. Uh -huh. And from them they can send out people like Ephesus to the whole area. We have a biblical strategy. Uh -huh. But the Lord has to open those doors. We can't make it happen. Mm -hmm. And so this is Brother Omani. He's in his 60s. Powerful voice. Been through so many trials in his life. Um, but you saw his family, his daughter Sherry married a guy called Emmanuel, God with us, and they had their first grandchild through him. And this is his, part of his students. He has a school in his own house in the village. And um, his wife Mary and him go farming every day, three or four miles walking. She's in her 60s. Can you imagine, ladies, being 60s, walking three or four miles every day with little hand tools? These are tough people. I admire them. Man, Normus Emmanuel, 39, got married. He was through our weightlifting ministry. Now he's preaching the truth, has a beautiful family. Mm -hmm. And when we went up there recently, got the Mercy Couple ladies into Christ. That was a wonderful thing. And the church there uh, built their own building. They fed us. They paid our gas. See, we're teaching to be independent of dependency on us, but on the Lord. And work with their own two hands and so forth. And support their own Amen. preachers. Yeah. And you know, look, I tell Americans, eat. Sorry. 
But eat, you know, eat your dogs and feed your preacher if you have to. <laughs> Pets are not gods. That's right. Amen. And we tell them the same type of tough stuff. Look at the widow of Zarephath. Yeah. Look at the little boy who gave his loaves and fishes. you got to have faith. Give your preacher the one CD you have or the 50 cents you have. Don't complain what you don't have. They learn to have faith through that. It's awesome. Brother Caleb is over here among his own people. His dad was a Muslim. He died before he could convert him. The kids all speak great English. They're being homeschooled by the mom. And they've got other kids joining him to start a little school. And uh, it's Juju, Voodoo over there. He speaks four languages. And um, we do help them get started with a little money. I'm not telling you you can't help anybody ever. Uh -huh. But it's, it's like bicycle training wheels. Yeah. You ever had training wheels? I did. One day, my dad's behind me, and I didn't know he'd taken them off. I didn't pay attention. He'd taken them off, and then I was riding without them. Yeah. That's what we want, is to teach them that they can do it. You've got the Holy Spirit in you. You're, you can overcome. And so these people are learning that and doing it. And they brought, he won his mother to Christ. And at our last preaching rally, uh, his wife has won a lady to Christ. It's, it's beautiful to see that happen. Mm -hmm. I could tell you great stories about Caleb. He's a, he would be a learning disability guy here. He would be written off as, as worthless here mm -hmm. in many places. He is an overcomer. Amen. He's yeah. an overcomer. You would not be impressed when you first meet him. Like Moses, he's slow of speech. Uh -huh. But the guy's profound. Yeah. And he just digs in there and people go, wow, this guy really knows the word. This is a, one last African preacher, Daniel, up here in the, where, we, where the war was in, in the Kokomba country. I say the only running water up there is when the lady coming from the well sees a snake and doesn't drop her, drop her bucket. <laughs> But his wife was so opposed, and he won her to Christ and his mother-in-law to Christ. He cleaned scorpion stings and snake bites. He's a hero there. He's learned English on his own. Mm -hmm. You give the guy a text of scripture, and he'll preach you a great message, because he just is in the Word. Mm -hmm. they got a Bible that thick in their language. It's hard to read. But you know what? The year we went up there, they finished the translation of the Bible. Is that a coincidence? Mm -hmm. Someone else did that. We didn't do that. Yeah. The Lord has a way. Amen. One last thing. You see the lady carrying water? Uh -huh. Daniel, at our last um, men's forum, talking about <coughs> African marriage, he was the last guy on the forum. And my son, he organized that whole thing. And he said, Dad, here's the names I picked. I said, they look great. But I said, Daniel's English is a little slow. He said, I'll, I'll go easy on him. The best guy there, of course, was him. And the thing he said was, in my village, none of the men, they will carry any water for their, for their wife. Me, I care water for my wife because I love her. Like Jesus loved the church. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. And the whole village hates that. <laughs> <laughs> the women love it. Yeah. <laughs> but the men hate it. But he doesn't care. See, that's what's happening. Um, I'm running out of time here, so I'm going to play a song for you. Uh, it's from Mark West, I think. It's about if not now, then when. And we're just going to let the pictures roll. And many, it'll show you pictures of many witnesses to the work there who've been to Ghana and participated. So my wife's going to play that song. And you just watch the pictures and think about what we've talked about. And I have one last word and I'll be done, brothers. Can you hear it? I'm sorry. Son. Can we put a mic on it? Is my connected? Yeah. It's right. Learning to serve. Dress up there. If not us, then who? That's the young man, Ben Angelo. Change. Brother Godwin will become our principal when he comes back from the States. He's right now getting a degree in computer um, certification. As I said, many of them get baptized into Christ.
Okay, turn that down. I'll just quick, as the picture's raw, so I want to say one one last story real quickly. Um, there was a, a wife, a young a lady, and um, she had a baby from a tribe where if your baby's seen by the father before they do certain rites to the ancestors, it's considered a, a terrible thing, a taboo against it. And there's a place called China, which is right next to, to the border of Burkina Faso, way up in the far north country, very remote. And Tim and Rose broke that culture. So when they went up to see uh, the grandma in her little hut, that night the entire village came angry, the men, drunk or half drunk. Bring the baby out, they said. We want to do the rites for the ancestors. And Rose, little lady, came and said, no, we've introduced the baby to Jesus. We don't need to. You think you're better than us? Some of them were Catholic. The priest allows us to do these things. Who do you think? We're Christians too. Some of us are Christians. And you think you're better Christians? See, that's the problem. Is it's syncretism and compromise. Mm -hmm. like yeah, what happened with Roman Catholicism. Yeah. And it happens all the time, see, unless there's a strong stand taken. She said, no. By the grace of God, the men didn't burn down the hut. Mm. And they didn't kill them. The next day, we picked up Tim and Rose. And Tim said, they lied to us. I said, why? They said if we do, broke that, we would go insane. But I'm still sane. <laughs> he actually thought that the demons might drive him insane for breaking that. He uh -huh. was still a young man in the faith in many ways. And he'd learned a great lesson of faith. Mm -hmm. That's, they have to do it. Yeah. We can't be there. It's like our kids go out. They have to be able to stand those tests by their faith. Another man, a man, uh, Brother Omani, you saw him. When his, wife, his daughter, Stella, was going to get married to a Christian man, Mr. Boateng, the, the relatives said, we're going to destroy that whole wedding if you don't follow the culture and pour libations to the gods. Mm. They, they're going to do it at first. I went through the whole book of Acts and showed that Christianity turns the world upside down, that it's a different way of life. It's a kingdom life. It's not cultural. And it has Amen. to be different. And you know what happened? His wife, Mary, took a stand. The wedding came on. And they had done it by faith. Yeah. Of course, we have weightlifters. He's going to come in there. We've got guys bench 430 pounds. Uh -huh. Brethren, I hope this encourages you. Uh -huh. yes. As the light shines in Africa, let it shine here in Amen. you yeah. and glorify our God. Amen. And that's the purpose today is to encourage you uh -huh. as we're encouraged by you. Amen. 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 Amen.